watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. From Toronto, Ontario, I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Later on, we will talk to Sheikh Naveed Aziz about a new report about preventing violent extremism in Alberta. But first, some news headlines. Facebook threatens Canadian safety, says Parliamentary Secretary. Quebec's top court decision opposed by Premier Legault. Nova Scotia recognizes Islamic Heritage Month. Ethiopian government lashes out against critics. And now, the details. The Heritage Minister's Parliamentary Secretary accuses Facebook of threatening Canadian safety after the tech giant threatened to stop sharing news if legislation passes that binds social media platforms to abide by commercial deals with news publishers. The Secretary says Facebook is threatening Canadians' online information. Bill C-18 is targeted at Google and Meta, the parent company of Facebook. The Parliamentary Budget Officer estimates the bill would force the tech giants to pay 30% of the cost of producing news. Google has been looking for amendments to the bill and Meta threatens to pull off news from its Canadian platform. Last week's ruling by Quebec's Superior Court to ban random traffic stops without legitimate reasons has been criticised by Quebec's Premier Francois Legault and the Association of Police Directors Quebec. Lawyers fighting racial profiling hail the decision, calling it a significant victory. The ban came after a 22-year-old black Montrealer complained of being stopped 10 times in 18 months. The Police Association's president says the ruling is, quote, an extreme measure. The city's mayor, Valérie Plante, said during a press conference yesterday, the ruling is a clear message that there is no place for racial profiling in our society. For the first time, Nova Scotia has recognised October as Islamic Heritage Month, just as it ended, reports a media source. The Muslim community celebrated the recognition, calling it a step forward. Ali Dual, member of the Legislative Assembly in Nova Scotia, says the recognition will show the next generations that they belong here. Dual says Islamic Heritage Month will also highlight the contributions of the Muslim community. Maritime Muslim Academy students spent the month learning and educating other students about their Muslim identity and culture. Students expressed themselves through posters, art and websites detailing Islamic history. The Ethiopian government on Friday said it can no longer tolerate what it calls defamatory falsehood supporting Tigrayan propaganda against Ethiopia being spread by some Western entities. The statement comes as peace talks between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray rebels in South Africa extend into this week. The Tigray conflict has killed thousands and displaced millions since November 2020. A month-long truce was shattered in late August, resulting in intense fighting between the government and the rebels. A report released by UN rights experts last month accused both the government and the rebels of committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that's it for the news. A new report last month on hate, extremism and terrorism in Alberta was recently released by an Edmonton-based think tank. To discuss its findings, we are joined now by Sheikh Naveed Aziz, who is a consultant to the Organization for the Prevention of Violence. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan for having me. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum. Thank you for making the time. This is a very important report and a very important topic that's been under the radar for many years. There's been a focus on violence uh, by Muslims. And the report, I think, focuses on, well, different kinds of violence. We'll get into that. Would you like to share with us what you think is the most important aspect of the report? 
I think from a community perspective, the most important aspect is what are we as a Muslim community going to do to defend ourselves? Clearly, we are one of the minority groups that is regularly under attack, particularly mm -hmm. our sisters of color that wear hijab are regularly being attacked. So what can we do to defend ourselves, protect our infrastructure, increase our literacy uh, in terms of protection, and even look uh, deeper as to you know what is causing these attacks on the Muslim community? How do you think the report on hate and extremism in Alberta will contribute to us doing that defense? So oftentimes when you look at right wing extremism, it's not very simple in the sense that if you if you look at the report in, in, in particular or if you look at general right wing extremism, there is this concept of, a, of salad bar extremism. Mm. And what that means is that these right wing individuals are picking and choosing different beliefs and different uh, segments of ideology to which they are identifying with. And then, you know, they're, they're going out and doing what they have to do. So right now, two of the biggest concerns are the uh, accelerationist uh, movements, which are those uh, movements that believe that there is uh, an inevitable clash that is going to take place between races. What can we do to uh, accelerate it? And then you have populist movements uh, as well that in general are just, you know, feeling uh, marginalized as if they are no longer on their home turf and their land and their uh, jobs and their wealth is all being taken away from them by immigrant populations. Uh, so these are two movements that, you know, are very, very scary uh, and need to be kept an eye on for sure. They are scary. One of the things that struck me when I was reading the report was the similarities between the rationales or the motivations for people joining such groups between the, those amongst the Muslims who turn to violence as a solution and those amongst these white ring, uh, white supremacist groups. And I, I noticed, uh, I'll just give you some examples of the similarities I found, uh, the idea that violence is the solution, the idea that, that violence is needed to sort of trigger the collapse and to get rid of the whole system. The system can't be reformed. It has to be like triggered and collapse it. Uh, the sense of feeling threatened, that the identity is threatened, and that the, the lone wolf activities inspired by these ideas. Muslim violence has been really targeted in Canada and around the world, you know, part, part of war on terror. And I feel that this kind of violence has been really under the radar. Can you just talk to us a little bit about these similarities uh, or, you know, what your perspective is? For sure. So I think we'll talk about one of the major differences as, as, as to why it goes under the radar. Number one, there hasn't been a major catastrophic event uh, like 9-11. And 9-11 was basically the turning point uh, in the terrorism world as to what they were going to be focusing on. And the mm -hmm. Muslim community became a target from that point on. And without such a drastic uh, turn in the narrative, it's going to be a very slow, gradual, and, and painful change. With that being said, the threat of right-wing extremism has always been there throughout history, uh, as, as of recent history, at least within the last 400 years. You'll always find that there were segments of right-wing extremism that took place. They just never came under scrutiny. Another element to, to look at, and you know, we can talk at uh, anti-racism work over here, but when you look at the powers that to be, it's often very hard to self-identify the problems from within. It's very easy to point the problems from the outside. And the Muslim community has often been perceived as a power from the outside. And therefore, it was very easy to pick, uh, to, to, to nitpick on uh, and bully. But now that, you know, problems are coming from within, we see this particularly in the United States that they've had several congressmen uh, that were part of the January 6th uh, attacks that took place uh, in D.C., uh, as well as other uh, politicians that were there. So looking inside and deeply scrutinizing yourself is a very, very difficult thing to do. So I think those are important things to highlight in terms of differences. With regards to similarities, I think you've hit the nail on the head that extremism is extremism, regardless of which vehicle it travels in. And you will find, you know, common uh, reoccurrences, a threat to one's identity, individuals often lacking purpose and meaning, group right. thinking and identification and a social uh, dynamic. And this concept of a, a lone actor and a lone wolf Oftentimes you'll see that they may be there may be only one individual that carries out the attack, but mm. in terms of the influence that's taking place, they're not alone. They are being influenced by other people, uh, implicitly or explicitly, directly or indirectly. They are definitely being um, influenced. So you will definitely find those similarities there. 
I mean, that was good how you put it, extremism is extremism. One of the things that I've noticed often in meetings with government officials is they come to the Muslim community and they talk to us about radicalization, radicalization, radicalization. And we're like, we don't know radicalization. We're concerned about hate crimes, hate crimes, hate crimes. And it's as if we're like talking past each other. But that uh, need to self reflect, I mean, obviously it falls on both of our shoulders. Uh, and, and I see this report as somehow making a contribution in that regard. Of course, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, this report is meant to highlight actually what's happening on the ground. Yes, you will have foreign feud between a few Muslims that go down uh, a dark hole and do end up becoming extremists. But at the end of the day, in terms of if you look at the actual attacks that are taking place in Canada, the two most catastrophic terrorist attacks that have taken place on Canadian soil were the uh, mosque attack in Quebec City, as well as the Afzal family that was killed in um, this past year in London, Ontario in mm. 2021. May Allah mm. subhanahu wa have mercy upon all of the deceased and accept them. Allahumma ameen. So with that being said, you know, you can't fight the facts. You can't argue with the facts. So I do believe that this report does make a good argument of uh, you know, we need to shift our policies and incre uh, increase our vigilance on these groups and even, you know, for, for law enforcement to start looking the other way, right? I, I saw a section on hate crimes, which I found unusual, actually, but very, very happy to see it. Yeah, so, I mean, there is a, a link between hate crimes and um, terrorism. And what that line actually is, you know, is something that academics continue to debate till this day. Terrorism is often defined as a use of fear or violence for the uh, change of, uh, of, of, of politics for religious or political uh, motivations. Now, mm -hmm. when a hate crime takes place, what is the motivation behind it? Oftentimes, if it's motivated by not hate of the individual themselves, but hate of a particular color, hate of a particular religion, hate of a particular gender, hate of a particular ethnicity, then all of those things you know, tread that line of possible terrorism if they're trying to change public policy and uh, public perception um, on those things. So it, there's a very fine line. So that is why oftentimes now, particularly when it comes to right-wing extremism, you will see an, uh, an inclusion of hate crimes in, in, in their memos and in their documents. The report talks about ideologically motivated violence, religiously motivated violence, and politically motivated violence as separate categories. And it goes in, you said, facts on the ground, actual groups in Alberta that are operating. As a scholar, I found that these categories didn't necessarily make sense because religion and politics and ideology are all part of one thing. But can you tell us very briefly uh, why those categories were chosen? So this was a, a change in uh, shift from Public Safety Canada in terms of trying to um, take away the stigma from certain groups in certain communities, particularly if you look at the, the Muslim community and the Sikh community, when it came to quote unquote, religiously motivated violent extremism, then, you know, they were always under the target, but they were hoping that if they can change the language around this, then those groups particularly would not be targeted. I do not believe it has been effective and more work needs to be done with regards to the language that we use in this field. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So much more we, I wish we could talk about, but thank you very much for joining us and giving us this glimpse. Jazakum al for having me. Thank you. Wa'ayakum. Thank you for watching. If you like what we do, please share, like, and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.